Hello, welcome to the Kitchen Table Ascension podcast hosted by Carrie Keegan and myself, B.B. Tinsley. We invite you to go to LunarSoulWisdom.com and play. You can discover more about Carrie's healing work at CarrieKeegan.com. And my writing and photography is at TheBBblog.com. Carrie and I were honored and thrilled to have the chance to speak with Simon Parks. Simon is a lifelong experiencer of ETs, shadow beings, elementals, and UFOs. He has shared that his soul is actually a perfectly balanced blend in three parts, hollow earth human, reptilian, and mantid, or mantis, as we say here in the States. Simon was an elected politician and served a full term of office. He's currently taking a break from politics, but he's likely to resume later on this year. He went public with his story in 2010, and since then he has toured the UK, speaking at conferences, initially attacked by the establishment media, of course, in a concerted effort to discredit him. However, in 2013, Simon was invited by the British Ministry of Defense to join a small party being given a tour of a secret space radar base in the UK, and this event totally confounded the established media and has led to a far more serious appraisal of Simon's story by them. Simon is also able to identify an individual soul star family background, and he's highly skilled at deprogramming, healing, and soul reading. If you feel that Simon can assist you in any way, then he would be delighted to hear from you. His website is simonparks.org, and he asks that you please use the contact page available on his site to get in touch with him. We recorded the following on Thursday, May 28, 2015. Enjoy this conversation with Simon Parks a wise, down-to-earth, and very practical galactic gentleman. I'll begin with, I wanted to go back to humanity's original template and our original DNA. To learn more about that, you speak a lot of four, the 4D races, and I'm wondering if in the combination of the 12 stands of DNA, there were also fourth and fifth dimensional contributions to the DNA. Yeah. No, because 12 strands of DNA meant that there were up to 12 dimensions. So being 12 strands of DNA meant that all of the dimensions up to the 12th were maintained within those DNA strands. That's why when we obtain those DNA strands, we have access to consciousness and source. Oh, I was thinking that a race contributed one strand. No, that's not. Well, they did. They did. And one race was a 12th dimensional. Okay. Was Lyra in one of those strands? Yes, absolutely. Very important. Is that fifth dimension? Uh, No, it's sixth dimension as we would understand it now. But the Lyrans have a corridor to the 12th dimension energetically. I see. Do they have a portal here on Earth? Lyrans, um, no, they use portals. They don't have their own dedicated portal, but they have a portal which they would use. There were several. Every alien race have portals they use. The difficulty for most alien races now is that the portals are either closed or guarded. The term um, quarantine has been used by people in the know Earth has been in quarantine for a while. The quarantine's been lifted. Uh, It's a partial quarantine at the moment. I am very curious about that. Does that relate to the so-called fall of consciousness? Yes, yes. When when humanity lost the 12 strands of DNA, in fact, you're actually using the modern term, which I prefer. In the old biblical sense, it was known as the fall of man. Hmm. But that is exactly what that was. The fall of consciousness. Go ahead, Gary. The, uh, you spoke of the portals, and I wanted to see. I was recently at the Hill of Tara, and I was, I, f- I thought I was going to connect inner earth to the inner earth, and mm-hmm. and the and Syri- I got a very clear message from the Syrian portal. I felt like that it could be turned on um, at some point, and I'm wondering. I was looking for, can these portals be turned back on as our DNA? Do we need to connect our DNA before we can turn these portals back on or? Yes, some some are code locked um, and only when a a certain individual, not just a person, but a certain individual uh, is at the right place at the right time, then that portal will open. Um, It might be pertinent as it's just done the rounds as the film The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. And The Hobbit has had a number of 
uh, elements which I've gone public with, which have shown that the creators of the artwork certainly understand the magic. But if we go back to J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Hobbit, of course he wrote that before he wrote Lord of the Rings, there is one story when the uh, dwarves and um, Bilbo are trying to find the door into the, uh, the cave. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to stand at the right place, at the right time, with the right person. And the right person, of course, is Bilbo. And in the story, um, J.R. Tolkien says that there is a key, and there's a physical key which they have. So here we have a portal which can only open when the right person is there at the right time, the proportioned time. And so it is with a number of portals that the right individual carrying the right DNA coding can open the portal if he or she is there at the right time. So yes is the answer. Does sound also increase the energy of these portals? No. Um, it, it's generally a DNA lock, um, but you can attempt to force a portal by projecting certain pitches of sound, or you can attempt to fool the portal into believing that it is coming up against what it was programmed to open to. Generally speaking, though, there are safety devices and the portal won't open. Um, you've got to be pretty desperate to, to try that element of it. Regarding the portals, are these inner portals within individuals? No. No, Both. No, you can have um, portal to portal or individual linked portal, or you can have a very large like mount mount. Um, is it Shasta? Shasta, yes. Shasta, where there is a very large portal there. Mm -hmm. uh, and several places over the planet where there are portals. Some of them are just local in the sense that they travel just a, a few hundred miles or a thousand miles. Some are very, very long ranging indeed. This is the time. It's very significant, isn't it, that we're all here on this planet at this time. I've heard you say that and I felt it and Carrie and I have felt it keenly. Can you speak about this time and what the significance of this time is? People on the planet divide into two groups, those who are there to observe, the watchers, but not in the technical sense as understood by uh, alien researchers, and those who are the actors, those who are taking place on the stage and are making things happen, either for good or for ill. So you are either here to observe or you are here to do. Um, the, the time is full circle now. Those of us who were here at the beginning are here at the end. And my words shouldn't be taken as the end of the world, but the end of a time frame and the beginning of another. So we are talking about a period of time where humanity has been held in slavery, and it is now on the verge of breaking out of that slavery and moving across to the next phase of its creation or the next phase of its evolution. So anybody, anybody who's alive on this planet now is blessed because they are in on the act. Whatever their role is, they are here to observe or take part in something that is very, very special. Um, and nobody came here for a holiday. Everybody came here for a reason, because you wouldn't come to this planet for a holiday. No. <laughs> Maybe in, in a few years you might. So it's a very, 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 if I use the word magical, I don't mean it in the, the dark sense. It's a very magical time, um, and it's a very exciting time. And I've always said, that humanity will come out the other end, but what I don't know is in what condition it will come out the other end. I don't know how much damage we are going to take as a species before we come out the other end. That is that is the unknown quantity. That's, we just don't know. So it's up to folks to step up to the plate, those who have an awareness. Would you say that it's a, a gathering momentum of, of positive energies? Yeah, so it's actually up to three quarters of the people in positions of responsibility to decide which side of the fence they're on. You know, if you, you haven't been involved in mass murder, then you can be forgiven. And these people who hold positions of responsibility need to check their own consciousness and say, right, well, I've had enough of this and I'm going to detach myself from those people at the very top. So that needs to happen. It needs to be the, the ordinary policemen, women, and soldiers on the street. What is their position in the coming two years? 
Where do their loyalties lie? Where's their consciousness? And then you've got the ordinary members of the public. Um, what will they choose? What will be their decision when the great deception is unveiled? What will those humans choose? Will they want more of the same, but with just a different label on it? Or will they want a completely new paradigm? And again, that is not known. Will the DNA activation be able to be self-directed or is just... It's a code. Yes, it's a, a predestined code that activates and no uh, life force, physical life force, has been able to decode it correctly or crack it. That's why humans are of such great interest to off-world entities because we call it the genome, the, uh, the coding, the tumbler lock. That is a code that is beyond the understanding of most life forms. And as a result of that, it is all pre-programmed. You don't have to um, boost it. It will just tick along to its own internal clock. That is why it, for many people, they're staring the gun, the barrel of a gun you know, down, down the front of it. Because if you know that humanity is at some point going to reach a position where it is going to say, I see through the deception, I reject this. Well, then why on earth would you be wanting to shore up or prop up something that is negative? Because you know, ultimately, it's going to fail. And the answer is that many of these people are in so deep and their own fear, because humans generally have a big battle with, with fear. They're so fearful and they, they haven't got the strength to get out of it. So <clears throat> we'll see. How can we impact that energy of fear? Is it can we impact that energy of fear? Well, <clears throat> yes. Um, it's basically uh, getting people to talk about the topic, because while the subject is hidden and taboo, then there's no debate, and people are isolated. Now, when you break the subject open and you go public, or you hold debates and you have question and answers, then the people who know the truth but have believed themselves to be islands surrounded by a sea, suddenly find that there is a debate out there and there is a widespread belief in the subject. So it's easier for people in positions of authority then to move towards the more central ground. So that's from the elite point of view. Now, from the human point of view, many people are seeking the truth. Many people know the established media are not giving them the truth. Mm -hmm. So they're trapped in the establishment because they have to earn a salary. That's how the system controls people through wages. But they're still seeking the truth. So the more truth they get, the more likely they are to begin to question why they get up every morning, why they work for somebody who earns 50, 60, 70 times what they earn and doesn't do half the work they do. Why is it that there are people dying and starving when these rich people are throwing food away because they've got more food than they need? So why does human consciousness accept these values? It accepts them because it's been tricked. Human consciousness has been tricked that this is the only way it has to be. In the American culture, it's accepted that, I don't know, let's just pull a figure out, 90% of the population can do really well and there has to be 10% in the gutter because that's the way it is. And that's accepted. But that's, that's the culture. Whereas really and truly, everybody should have the chance to do well. So what I'm saying to you is that as long as the human psyche, the human ability to comprehend and develop is trapped in an energy cage, then it cannot expand. Now, shows like this and other talks like this help to penetrate that cage and to actually engage with people. So that's why I agreed to, to come and talk to you, because I want it to go out. I want people to go away and do their own research. Um, and, you know, if we... If we just communicate <clears throat> with 10,000 people and 1,000 people go and do their own research, that's 1,000 people who have the opportunity to learn and develop truth. Beautiful. That's why we do it. Beautiful. Right. I, I want to switch tracks slightly. I am fascinated by your triadic soul parts if you will. Okay. It's just fascinating. And I've heard you speak at some length about the mantid connection and the reptilian connection, which I prefer to call the dragon connection. 
I haven't really heard you speak about the hollow earth human part. Would you mind elaborating a bit for us? <clears throat> I've always been fairly quiet about it because it is the one link that is hidden and that's why it's remained hidden and ever since Admiral Byrd <laughs> attempted to get in there and was ejected forcibly, <laughs> it has remained uh, private and confidential because it has a role to play in the future and you can trace its links back to Lemuria, to Atlantis, to a group of humans who decided to take themselves away from the corruption as they saw it um, around them and to be separate and pure and then to only come out when the time was right um, when the battle was finally joined. Uh, so I've deliberately not spoken about it simply because just as in, in the days of uh, Admiral Byrd, it still remains hidden. And so, yes, the three parts of the soul work, work very well. <laughs> Do you know how that was constructed? Who, what constructed that three perfectly balanced yes, structure? Yes, um, I've always said that humans were not created by aliens as much as one particular faction would like us to believe that was the case, it isn't. Humanity has been around uh, in the multiverse for a very, very long time. But the human form that we have today is relatively new. Uh, I never accepted for one minute the Darwinian theory of evolution for humans. I accept it for animals, no problem at all. But for uh, human evolution, um, I'm sorry, it just doesn't fit. It's not enough time frame to develop the complex creatures that we on this planet are. So it always was clear to me that something had happened, that some form of uh, enhancement or development has taken place, probably on many accounts. And so um, as far as I'm concerned, somewhere between 220 and 250,000 years ago, uh, the predominant uh, Stone Age person on this planet would be referred to as Neanderthal around that period. Um, People tend to think of Neanderthals as perhaps within 100,000 years. That's not actually true. The stone technology, the stone tools they make show that they have gone back to about 300,000 years mm -hmm. ago. Around about 220, between 220 and 250, when humans were technologically useless, but spiritually absolutely wonderful, mm -hmm. they were altered and changed. And the 10 strands of DNA were removed from them. But because you see of multiverse or universal law, or perhaps better, the law of source, it is illegal with great consequences to destroy or kill DNA. You cannot do it. So what happened was that it was placed what I call out of phase, so neither in the third dimension or the fourth dimension, just out of phase around every human. So there is an arc around every human. And humans understand that as their higher self. Your higher self is your ten strands of disarticulated energetic DNA that hang over your body. DNA is a memory. You can actually recall memory if you can link in. And many people think they are accessing the Akashic records. They're not. They're actually accessing their DNA memory. And so it is this that is trying to regain into the body. So it is doing what it's always supposed to do, get back into the body. And some people are better at it than others. And so people are at different speeds of integrating their DNA. Were you trained to, in that model to work with that DNA connection with the soul, turning it back on? I'm not sure the right wording here. And is there helpful tools that you know of? No. That, that is something that uh, I don't have. I'm not activating 10 strands of DNA. I'm probably at eight. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's impressive. Do you know how to figure mm. that out in your body? Um, it's not impressive because if it was impressive, I'd be at 10. So there's obviously <laughs> a lot. How to figure out in your body? Well, it, 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 it does it itself, but there are certain things that you can do to speed up the connectivity. But you have to be careful because if you force the issue, um, then the energies are such that it can um, affect you, not physically so much, but energetically. So you, mm -hmm. you can begin to have very poor memory loss and you can have migraines, um, get dizzy spells. And so I, I'm very, very careful. But, but, you know, it's part of what I do. You know, people can come to my website and I will help them with that. But it is always at their speed mm -hmm. that the body can cope with, not the mind. So the mind says, I want to do this tomorrow. And I say, look, 
it's going to take three months. I see. Yes. Some progression is involved there. I'm getting an image that looks like standing waves. I can't recall there's a, a, an actual scientific term for it. The standing wave technology that um, is both good and bad that is available today. Is this relatable to the energetic strands of the DNA? Well, Tesla was perhaps one of the greatest scientists ever. And unfortunately, of course, you know, we always give that accolade to Einstein. It's not right, it's Tesla. Tesla's scalar wave or scalar wave That's it. Uh, is a device that you're referring to yeah. um, that operates in a very different way from an electromagnetic wave. Uh, unfortunately, like so many things, they've been weaponized and are used um, against people um, in many, many ways. Um, and I spend quite a lot of my time working with people who are the subject of an attack from scalar waves. Mm -hmm. I did an interview, um, a guy came from Holland and another yes. guy from Germany. And we talked quite, quite extensively on that. Yes, I saw that interview. It was very, very interesting and very, very illuminating. I am very intrigued, Simon, with, you put a call out, I think originally it was on, um, via Carrie Cassidy and Project Camelot, about a group of yeah. awake and aware people who wanted to, can you speak to that, please? Yes, um, I now have 500 names. Wow. 500 people uh, have put themselves forward, and I'm in the process of grouping them, those that are healers, those that can send energy over distance, those that can send energy at a, a local rate, those that are good at computers, those this, that, and the other. I'm getting all the group together. And then once I've got that group, I'll um, apportion tasks to them. That's so beautiful. Thank you for doing that. It's, really. Well, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because Dr. Stephen Greer mm -hmm. raised mm -hmm. a large amount of money and made a film. And I would have to ask, how has it changed humanity? Now, David Icke, who I've got a lot of time for, I've got a lot of time for David, tried it a bit differently and created a radio and a TV show in, in the hope of engaging with people. And through no fault of his own, actually, it was taken down. But the mistake that both men made was they used the system as it stands. They used the structures and the organizations of an already corrupt system to try to carry their message. It doesn't work. So I've not gone for the system that creates structures. I've not gone for businessmen, bank accountants, uh, this, that, and the other. I've gone for ordinary individual people that will work as groups. No hierarchy. No, I'm better than you. No, I'm going to come in and tell you what to do. No machinery, no cameras, no nothing. Just pure good intent. And so this is the mistake many people make. They think on a 3D materialistic way the changes are coming and nothing to do with that. They're to do with energies. Humans can create reality out of thought mm. once they understand it. They are creators. Mm -hmm. So going back to our, our assistance that we have here, do you think our greatest assistance is gathering together to make this choice to turn this planet back to a choice-based planet? Is it humans getting together? Is it opening the portals with the help, whether it's in hollow earth or portals from uh, information from those stellar energies. Yeah, yeah. The greatest hope for humanity is itself. Mm -hmm. uh, all I'm doing is giving it focus. Uh, I rather see humanity as a child that's crawled for far too long and it's time for it to get up on its legs and walk. And every time it gets up on its legs, it falls down again. But it needs somebody to keep saying to it, get back up, get back up on your legs. I mean, David Icke was always saying, get off your knees. Mm -hmm. But he didn't really follow it through in a way that painted an image for people to really grasp. And I'm giving the image of a child who is struggling along on his hands and knees and keeps getting up. All I'm doing is giving the encouragement because it's down to the human race to decide what it wants to do. Look, if the human race says, we're really happy the way we are, then it can stay like this for another 50,000 years. But if the human race says, you know what, we're not happy, there is a better way to do this, then it will then move on to the next stage. And it is its choice. There is assistance coming from the planet, but that's just to balance the books. Um, there's absolutely no point in somebody coming in and saying, 
do you know what? Sit back, have a rest. I'll do it all for you. And then doing it all for you. And, and anybody who's listening to this who's a manager or is a, <clears throat> a mum at home and says to the child, I'll tidy your room up or I'll do this, I'll do that. That person has not bought into the process. That person has not... That's my cat. Sick cat. <laughs> That person has not partaken of the responsibility. And so when that person, the parent, goes out of the room, that person thinks, well, I've not been given the tools to understand to do that. So when the problem comes up again, they have to call the parent back in and say, can you put it right for me? How much better it is to say to the individual, you do it, because once you've done it, you will always be able to do it, and you can take ownership of that. Far too often people say, when are the good guys going to come and save us? Mm. I'm sorry, this isn't Hollywood. There's no Custer. There's no 7th Cavalry. And I've always said it, the human race is the 7th Cavalry. It's got mm. to do it. Because if it doesn't, frankly, it's not worthy. That's a horrible thing to say, but it's a fact. You're not ready for it. Yet the problem is the time is now. So if you imagine my hand here is the time, if the human race is here, it's behind the time. We've got to get it measured up so that when we hit that finishing line, then we are the right people at the right time at the right place. Because if we're out energetically either way, the next stage won't happen. Well, I for one believe that we are all up to the task. And I believe that it takes faith, that sense of love. We haven't spoken about love. It's all about love. And when I, the more I am waking up, the more sense of injustice I feel about these things being hidden. You know, as you were speaking about combating the system from within the system and how it's not working, you remind me of what Alex Collier said a few years ago of what the Andromedans taught him about holographic thinking and that we on Earth are in this outmoded, very obsolete mode of hierarchical or pyramidical top-down. And I think you were speaking about Dr. Stephen Greer and, and David Icke. They were working from that. And it strikes me that the system that you're putting together is that holographic, you know, each circle group of folks all over the globe has the strength of every other point. Each one holds the point of love, the point of strength, and as people awaken, I'm, I'm feeling a surge of, of um, uh, there are no English words, there are no human words for this feeling, but that's why we're here, Simon. I, I do want to, I, I want people to know that, listen to what Simon has to tell us. This is the time, and Carrie and I have been saying that since we've been putting out the podcast. There's this sense of immediacy, of urgency, of taking back our seniority because it belongs to us. And in that awakening, Simon, would the awakening demands a maturity at an absolute accelerated pace. It requires such maturity. Mm -hmm. how, how do we go about not only w in this awakening and learning these, you know, masteries and having these interdimensional experiences, what can you say to developing our maturity on all these different levels that I hear you say are totally required at this time in order to do what we need to do? I think it's for the human race to work its own maturities out. <clears throat> Every time there's a false flag, Every time something happens, does the human race just shrug its shoulders and say, well, it didn't happen to me, and so they don't care? Or do they say, well, that's funny, because that person I saw in the last false flag. Or why is the camera just in the right place every time something happens? Or, you know, is this a rehearsal for something? So when enough people begin to see through the rather poor charade that's played out, then the development will occur. And no matter what I say or anybody else says, it will have no effect unless people want to hear the message. When you're, I was thinking you've you've been, had some extensive training uh, since you were young in opening your eyes. Uh, so, and dealing with that, this, uh, uh, oh, uh, this knowledge, you know, a full disclosure, and. W I'm wondering 
you, you know, you've had more time to wonder, how, you know, how um, the effective uh, methods and tools to sounds like you are doing it you're you're saying it's going to happen from humanity and we get together and we combine our consciousnesses as the greatest accelerator towards disclosure um i that that i was thinking that it was more towards you know opening up and getting assistance getting higher vibrational tools either within or um, our being or in conjunction with higher vibrational beings to begin to, to work at a higher, uh, more effective, more efficient level in opening. And, and I'm hearing you say, well, just the focus may be better put in aligning the people, the many, many people and their belief systems the, the on that. Human, the human race is everything it needs now to make the change it has the tools the question is whether people will choose to do that so it's not about bringing in extra resources or extra this or extra that the, the, the key is there the ability is there is the willingness there because as long as somebody can go to work and I'll use American terms and make enough dollars hmm. to just pay the bills just have enough food maybe just have a little bit to put towards a foreign holiday or whatever it is that you want to do seems to keep people under control and people are terrified to rock the boat they're terrified that the little they have they're going to lose and it's all about fear um, and that if they'll actually stood back and look at what they've got they've got very little I mean, in, in private circles um, the prediction is that the middle class in America will be destroyed in the next five years economically so that's a really big interesting key because these are the people who are the ones that go and vote these are the ones that are quite articulate these are the ones who've been to to university or college as you guys would say i think the thing is that as long as enough people think that they can get by then why would they try and change something but as soon as something happens to affect them materialistically they'll suddenly start to question everything that's how the elite have captured and held prisoner the vast majority of people because they've just had enough crumbs thrown to them to stop them from rebelling. Think about it. One percent of the planet's population rules 99 percent. Now, on a off-world law, the, the math that I've just given you would imply that the 99% are willingly allowing the 1% to rule them. Because otherwise, why do the 99% not eject or throw off the ruling 1%? So there is a very, very strong law that says in such circumstances, others cannot come in and take the action because the majority of the people want this system. And that's why I, I, I struggle to get across to people who, who want something to happen and saying, but 99% of the planet are ruled by 1%. So who is right here? You I, know, think I, I, I say to people, you don't want them, and you don't want them, and you don't want them, but this is a rarefied atmosphere. This is the awake group. These are the people who know the truth. There is a multitude of people out there who don't want to know the truth, don't care about it as long as they've got just enough money to, to buy the, the bits. And when that changes, that's when the great balance will tip. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a different situation that causes humanity to change direction. Wow. Sorry. What a paradox this is, because on the one hand, most of humanity is holding the head like the ostrich in the sand. There is this sense of complacency and this sense of no, 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 I don't want to know because everything is fine the way it is. But we've been taught that kind of behavior, and this is the injustice that I was speaking of, that um, it's such a, a, a paradox and it's so ironic. So can we, those of us who are becoming more aware all the time, who desire not to have our heads in the sand, is there something, I suppose, I, I guess, let me see, ask you this, Simon. What I'm hearing you say is that it's for each of us to go inside and access our own 
authentic selves. And in doing that, simultaneously coming together in groups, right? Is that correct? Is that Yes. It's about finding like-minded people, people that share the same outcome. You see, I do on my, my website, I do what I call soul readings, where I will look at somebody and I will tell them what their star family is. And frankly, it doesn't matter whether you have a reptilian soul or a Palladian soul if you wish the same thing. So we don't judge people by what they are. We judge people by what their intentions are. Mm -hmm. So if your intention is, I want the, for the freedom for the human race, then that's the sort of person that I want to talk to. But if the person's intention is, I want to keep everybody down, um, then you know those people won't be part of the group. So we naturally find people who share the same values that we do. And so what I've said to people, both privately and publicly, is network, join together, form groups. And if you're very lucky, you'll have two or three people in your locality, maybe 20, 30, 40 in your state, where I know the America's a massive country, but maybe once a year people can get together and have a, have a, have a community bonding session. Um, I plan over the coming months to run sessions in this country where I will uh, book some venue and people can come over and we can connect and link. Um, but we need to be strong because if in the future the internet is taken down, we need to create a thought where people don't rely on technology. So in other words, if you uh, are totally technologically minded and the internet comes down, you suddenly feel alone, isolated terrified you've seen people whose computers don't work they sit around biting their fingernails <laughs> it's they, true they're that addicted to it so if a situation occurs and the internet is turned off for any reason i need people to be self-contained and strong and ready and not fearful and working together as groups and teams to support each other so that's that's what we need to do we need to build resilience and i often refer to the Second World War, because in Great Britain, Germany uh, really quite devastated a number of cities in Britain. But back in those days, very few houses had fridges. Very few houses had indoor toilets. In <laughs> Britain was not a very developed country back then. But the, the morale of the cities didn't break because people back in those days were still very tied to a very basic lifestyle. Now, where you have a holiday period and they sell out of bread within three hours, or Christmas is coming up and there's mad rushing to the shops, if you were to cut off any supplies, there isn't that resilience in the, the civilization to survive because people rely on others to do it for them. But back in the 1930s, an early 40s when the Second World War, there was still a training amongst grandparents and great-grandparents to be resilient and to know ways around it. Well, that isn't the case now. If you took a 19 or 20-year-old person and you uh, took away their, their mobile phone and you took away their iPod and you took away their um, quick dinners from the microwave, how would they cope? So this is what's happened through deliberate planning the human race has lost its individuality and it's lost its ability to um, be strong and has been trained to rely on others. And this is what we've got to change. Spreading self-reliance. Excuse me for, um, this makes me very, very no. happy to hear you say this. That's right. Because without it, without, without it, we are being created into a hive mind. And you take one out and everybody collapses. And what I want to do is to create groups that are standalone. So that if one group is compromised or taken out, it does not impact on the operation of the others. The increase of your mind, like telepathy, your and uh, communicating, to um, is an as a resource that seems vital in this vision. Vile. Said vile. Vital. 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 Yes. You know, a very a crucial element in going forward and developing this as as we are raising our vibration and I was curious that there, in ways yours was turned on very early am I right your your ability to read and I'm wondering at what 
point, this to me it seems very crucial to begin to teach people as we are in those yes, roots yes, yes. Uh, and that's, that's, communicate that's, that's, without. Um, absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. Um, look, the human race is not yet ready to make a trunk call from New York to London, <laughs> uh, two people sitting cross-legged on a carpet. That We're not there yet. <laughs> we will but be. But what we can do at some yeah, point, absolutely. Yeah, we will. But not at the moment, generally. But yeah. what we can do is give people the, the gifts and skills to know when they're being lied to. That's a really important psychic ability. Being able to, to read the future is useful, but it's not the reliance for, for, for the human race. The human race just needs to know when it's being lied to. That would be great. Um, can you imagine a situation where you couldn't lie to anybody? Wow. How that would just change everything, you know? That's um, vibrational alignment you're talking. You're feeling it in your body. You you understand that vibration when that hits you. Is that? Yeah. The, yes. I mean that, that's it, and it's lowest level. Um, I mean, I, I I never go into somebody's head unless it's a matter of life and death because that's a, that's an invasion of their privacy. But if there was a, a real serious reason why I would do it, I, I would do it, and I've done it three times. But generally speaking, we would look to train or I would look to train someone in what I would call passive receiving in other words you don't have to actively go into a person's head to know if they're lying you would detect the vibrational um, discord that is created by that human because humans actually aren't designed to lie lying was part of a program matrix given to them by the reptilians so when the human body lies it's actually a very telltale signature now if you train somebody to be able to detect that then they've done nothing but just stand there or sit there and they can pick that up and detect that so that's what I would train people this is this is fundamental and I'm relating as being an adoptee where I grew up being lied to thinking that that was the truth and I recognize I feel the importance and the significance of being able to ascertain and to discern if I could walk through life knowing this what a difference it would make and imagine the w you you just would be it would be so transparent and it would demand this maturity um, on a, a, a completely um, collective level this is really amazing and foundational information and I thank you for that Simon imagine I think thank you it's it's a pleasure imagine though that most people don't understand about lying they don't understand the effect it has and the best way I will paint a picture I mean your listeners are already there so really I want to be reaching people who are just on the verge of waking up but imagine I have a class of 30 children and I take 10 of them and I take them into another room and I show my 20 children in one class a color chart and I point to the color green and I say that color is called green. It's the same color as the grass, right? I go to my 10 children and I point to the color green and I say, that color is called red. When those children grow up, they have a hell of a time because they have been told that that color green is called red. And they have been lied to in this model that I've put forward by the educational system. And it's called brainwashing in the very basic and broadest sense of programming. And that simple diagram that I've given the audience now, you can imagine the subtleties that go on throughout life, not just in the educational system. And so that is how people are trained and programmed. And there's no leash around their neck. It's all programs of the mind. And so what humanity has to do is to be able to say, actually, that's not red, that's green. And nobody told me, I just know that's a fact. So that's where we need to be with the human race, that the human race says, that is fundamentally wrong, I am not doing it. That's when we get the change. You see, what the system wants is 100,000 people throwing rocks, petrol bombs and stones at a demonstration because that energy is useful and can be then dealt with in force. What they don't want is what we saw in the days of the, the hippie movement, the flower power. That was we nearly top nearly toppled a government because a hundred thousand people sitting on a busy road junction with no violence the system cannot cope with that the system cannot cope with it now I know it's it's a difficult situation but 
in 1979, the Shah, I think it was 79, the Shah of Iran was overthrown. Now that was an, almost a bloodless revolution, apart from the, the Air Force. And what they did, they did exactly what they did in America, they started putting flowers down the barrels of the gun. The systems can't control with peaceful demonstrations. That's why you get agent provocateurs who go in and start the trouble to change the energies. So, you know, if imagine half of the population of America didn't go and fill their cars up with gas on a Monday. By Tuesday, the prices would come down. If half the population of America boycotted a particular shop, that would change. Now, we saw it a little bit with, uh, with a coffee shop a coffee company fairly recently last year where it was actually through social media they got so much bad publicity that they had to do changes people don't realize how powerful they are and the system is fearful that people realize the potential strength they have mm -hmm. so this is what we want non-violent use of change you know if there was to be violence it will be done at the military level it won't be done on on the street level because that's pointless and even more and more military people are coming forward because they just cannot go down that path any longer, which I find very exciting. Well, if you if you look at Jade Helm, the situation there is very interesting because the, and I did discuss this on another radio show, so I'm just hoping that it's not going to bore people because they may have heard it already. But one of the reports that the National Security Council took was that the military was too closely knit with its community whereas the police are not. In other words, every every block, there's some girl cooking cookies for veterans or there's some boy out there rattling a tin in, trying to raise money for veterans. The military and the community are very closely joined and only a very few soldiers would shoot on their own community, but not necessarily so with the police in America because the police are so estranged from the community that more police officers are likely to shoot at the public than the military, but you've only got one million cops in America, so it's not going to work. So Jade Helm was a war game with physical soldiers going around the different states, but all the information fed into a computer. Um, two states of great interest, Texas and California. Texas is because Texans don't like being pushed around, and the Californians because they're very alternative and they question. So these were two states the American system didn't want to lose. So they've been planning out war games, which states would we lose, which states can we hold. And it wasn't, people don't understand, and I want to put them right here. Jade Helm was not about striking fear into the population. It was not about rolling trucks and tanks and men in uniform through your high street. It was to try and make the soldiers feel separate from the community. It was to drive a wedge between the community and the military. It was to say to the soldiers, you're not part of the community. You wear a uniform. Look, here you are in a, in a great long row of trucks and tanks. You're looking down at the people. They're not like you. You're different. So Jade Helm has two phases, the, the war play, the role games, the computer modeling, and the point to the soldiers that you are separate from the people and you will do what you are told. That's what Jade Helm is about. So we need to incorporate our policemen in our community and to a greater well, degree. You, you have a terminology that is not used, to my knowledge, in European countries. It's certainly not used in my country, and you, you guys have been using it for a while. It's called surge. And the police, the cops were the first to go into this, where you gather 100 police cars. They all sit along the street, put all their lights and sirens on, and aimlessly drive around and around and around and around. Taxpayers' money. Why aren't those police out on a real call? 911. Someone's being robbed. You've got 100 bloody police cars and police officers sitting there. Who's, who's patrolling the streets? What is the point of that? The point of that is to say, we are the police. And it is, again, it's all part of this us and them. And the, the, the sooner the human race people in America understand what's going on, the quicker this will just unravel itself. You know, it's like often uh, people say, there's going to be this happening, there's going to be that happening, and it never happens. Mm -hmm. And so people say, oh, I'm not going to believe it anymore. You know, you said this was going to happen and it never did. What they don't realize is the very fact that the community was discussing it, it prevented it occurring. Because there are a handful of men, and they are men, sitting around a table, and they say, we have a plan, this is going to happen on this date, it leaks out, 
then on the alternative media it's doing the rounds, we've been caught out. We won't be able to pull the wool over the eyes of the public. We won't be able to hoodwink them. We can't sucker them. So we're going to have to pull the plans. But the general public think, oh, it was, a, it was just a load of hype. But time and time again, some very serious situations have been saved because people on the alternative media have brought the topic up. It's just worth mentioning. Yes, I'd say so. And uh, it <laughs> makes me want to uh, go for the top level and, and gather momentum for not paying for our military here in America. That's since I was a young child, it does not make sense. The portion of our work that is going to a military government that does not, that is a very basic great against who I am. And, uh, you know, it's just trying to extrapolate how to do that on a larger level and defund. If we got a lot of people defunding the government, we could perhaps pull them back from all of their invading. I think I think that that isn't going to happen like that because people at this stage, the human consciousness level is not high enough to do that. But it's going to take a very large happening of some sort, which is going to um, fundamentally rock the consciousness of America and will make people question everything. It's very, very popular to be anti-government, whichever government it is. Nobody believes what the government says. Mm -hmm. People still do what they're told mm -hmm. because they don't know any other alternative. So what's missing is an alternative option and a realization that the system is bankrupt. So when they understand that the system they have is just going nowhere and is going to take them down, then they'll want something different. Unfortunately, the vast majority of humans, the jalopy has to fall apart around them before they'll get out of that car and go find another car. As long as the wheels are still turning, even if it's only one mile an hour, they'll still stay in the car. But when that stops finally and the bits fall off it, that's when they then get up and say, well, what do we do now? That's what we're waiting for. That's the moment. And it will be an economic collapse of some sort because as long as people have dollars in their wallet or their purses, they will still go about their everyday life. When that happens and they're hit with that, they will then look for an alternative. And so basically, we will always have a minority of people who are awake until the vast majority uh, have it literally in their face like that. Um, and I don't want people to, to have pain. I don't want suffering. But I'm fast coming to the opinion that that is necessary to wake people or shake them out of their lethargy and to make them say, this life is no good. I want better. That's, so that's well, it's coming up to our time now. Yes. I know I originally said an hour, so if we could sort of wrap it up in a bit, I'd be very grateful. Absolutely. I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Simon, and you've given us much to think upon. We wish you blessings in your journey. Good safety. May you stay you. safe and with us for a long time. And we I, hope I, will. I have no intention of leaving the planet just yet. Good. Great. <laughs> Carrie, lovely. It's always delightful to see you, my, my darling. It is. And I hope we can continue the conversation at some point. We can we can do a follow-up if you guys would like. Um, that's absolutely fine. I'd be delighted to do it. You are two wonderful people. You're both good intention, good souls. Um, you know, so it is a pleasure for me to connect with decent people. Um, God knows I see enough people that are not so decent. So when I, I meet good soul people who are have the highest intentions, then obviously I want to spend time with you too. So thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure and an honor for me as well. Great. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank and you, God Simon. Bless. God okay. bless you. Take good Bye. care. Goodbye, Simon. Good night. Simon.